Hello and welcome to Inspiring Interviews, conversations about breath. This is where we take a well-known breath worker and we have a conversation together and we find out what inspired them into their breathwork journey and what they would like to inspire others as well. Now I'm very excited uh, today. We have Mark Sutton with us and I've been following Mark Sutton for about three or four months now and I'm really excited about Mark because Mark is in a very small place in the Venn diagram where science and microbiology cross with breathwork because he had a long career in science. But then he moved after 20 years into areas of breathwork and human development. And he started working in Tantra, relationship coaching and massage. Now it was when he started uncovering in his own childhood traumas that he started to develop an interest in how he could support others. And six years ago, he discovered biodynamic breathwork and trauma release and started the training and 15 months later after immense journey of self-discovery and healing he became a certified practitioner now mark has worked assisted and trained with some of the top teachers in the world and holds qualifications in massage personal relationship coaching tantra cognitive behavioral therapy osho meditation and bbtrs he's been through the experience of the techniques himself he knows the challenges and the pitfalls that comes with, that comes with successes and a sense of achievement, self worth, and confidence. So, really, Mark, you have walked the walk, as you have to if you become a breathwork facilitator. So, welcome to our inspiring interviews. Lovely to have you here. It's lovely to be here. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, yeah, it's it's interesting reflecting when you reflect my bio back to me what uh, what a journey it's been for me um what a moving through straddling two fields the scientific field and the more um philosophical hysteric fields as well yeah it can be interesting yeah i think you're going to be able to offer really some really good insights into this mm. so if it's okay i always like to start these interviews just with a breath just to really bring us into presence with each other and um, so we can really be totally here and if you're watching this live on facebook or on our youtube video i really encourage you to take a breath with us right now as well is that okay with you mark oh it, it, it absolutely is in these times it absolutely is yeah great all right, let's just take a simple breath with each other. Thank you. So in these interviews, um, I like to find out about people's stories, about their journey, because I want to inspire people about breathwork and hearing people's stories about what's led them into breathwork I find fascinating, I find inspiring. And if I find it, I kind of generally think other people will as well. Yeah. But before we start on like hearing the stories, can we just have a few facts about you? So tell us your, your, your full name, your age, where you live. Um, any, give me 30 seconds of facts about Mark. Right, okay. Full name is Mark Darren Sutton, age 56. Born in Wigan, uh, Lancashire. Went down to Guildford University, studied microbiology, went up to Ireland, studied molecular biology, lived in Ireland 22 and a half years, moved out to the civil service into tantric field and came back to the UK 2016, 2017 and now living in Todmorden. And there's a potted history of me going around the world, <laughs> oh, or at least between Ireland and England. <laughs> Uh, well, that's pretty good. So you have you've had a journey, a physical journey, um, mm. from from England to Ireland, yeah. and then back again. But you've had this energetic journey going from the kind of empirical science world out 
into into a kind of what is a more esoteric field or a more you know a softer kind of journey as well so that's a fascinating journey i, but, I don't think they're incompatible uh, you oh. know doing what i'm saying like the science of breath and how great breathing affects the neurobiology the neurochemistry the particularly in the field I'm working in now, looking at, say, polyvagal theory as well. That's right up my street. I can get mm. my teeth into that aspect of it as well. Mm. But coming back from this solid grounding in from the science basis, my Tantra teacher, Don Cartwright, said, you embody the science of Tantra. You know, and, and there's, there's, there's different aspects. There's good and bad to that. It's, it's that solid grounded thing that uh, can keep you present, but maybe you're missing some aspects that maybe you, you, you want to open up to on a more hysteric level. Yeah, so it's really interesting how, how I develop things and how I work with things. Yeah, I agree. There, there doesn't have to be any difference or any conflict between the two fields at all. They're just different approaches to looking at the same, yeah. you know, the same painting or listening to the same music, really. Yeah. Okay, well, before we go into you know, your journey into that world, let's, let's take a step back. Let's go before you started um, moving into um, science. Let's go back to when you were young. Mm. Now, one of the things that I always ask people is who or what inspired when you, when you were young, you know, everyone usually has a teacher. Everyone usually has something that kind of really fired them up in their imagination. So if it's okay, I'd like to, to maybe, Go back to little Mark um, back in the 70s or 80s, whenever it was, um, when you were young. And tell us about who you were back then. Well, do you know, it, it's really interesting. It's only recently I've been uncovering memories of that age, of, of, of being pretty young. And in listening to your talk there, I'm thinking, well, who, who really inspired me? Um, and, and the first thing that came to mind... <laughs> was like, like a 12, 14 year old boy when this certain film came out in 1977 and we got a very old Alec Guinness being Obi-Wan Kenobi. And I thought, ooh, so my inspiration actually probably would be from Star Wars, <laughs> believe it or not. At that age, that was my young inspiration. And that's the first thing that came up from my, in my memory when you mentioned that. So it's, it's capturing that imagination of the, of the science and the science fantasy, if you like, all together wrapped up in one and wrapped up in a, um, in a package that, that, that is, is not necessarily good and evil, but is looking at all these different aspects of the human existence as well, you know. Beautiful. Uh, and I really resonate with that as well. Obviously sharing a name as Ben Kenobi, um, like I do. Um, and also he, you know, he's one of the first people, or not one of the first people, but he's like those kind of ninjas. Um, he kind of made that esoteric kind of mystical side really cool, you yeah. know, you know, something magical, but also really cool and desirable rather than just being stuffy old religions that your parents did. So yeah, I love that. Oh, uh, yeah, the idea of the force being this all-pervading energy that's around us that we can use and utilise, and we feel it when we're at peace. It's like that's sort of taking from a lot of, 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 um, of uh, ancient teachings, really. So yeah, you know. So I mean, I'm already feeling young. Mark was quite drawn to that kind of. Back then it would have been called religious, but it's not really. It's kind of energetic. It's spiritual. It's esoteric. It's about something non-material. Um, okay, so let's go, let's dial it back even a little bit further. Tell us about um, even younger, Mark. What was life like for you when you were, you know, really young? Tell us about your family. Tell us about, tell us about your life then. Paint us a picture. Yeah, the, um, I think the, the scene was set, the background to the picture was set very much when I was born. So I was born in 1964. So that was 56 years ago now. Um, but I was, um, due to a poor medical procedure on my mother years previously, um, I was three months premature. So yep. my weight, birth weight was two pounds, 10 ounces. Wow. So that meant that on the, pre the pregnancy itself had been very, very, very stressful for me uh, and for my mother as well. And so I was struggling with the medical conditions 60, you know, 56 years ago to survive. And so was my mother, she was struggling to survive as well. So I was in an incubator for six months. 
well, I began to uh, strengthen my lungs, of all things, you know, and uh, that really set the scene at the, 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 the subconscious level about what my view on life was going to be, that it was going to be a struggle. I think if you follow Reich's stuff, um, that would be sort of um, almost like the uh, schizoid type, the type that really just doesn't think you have a right to be here. Mm -hmm. things are always going to be a struggle so that actually did set some of the scene for what's going going to go on later in childhood and then um like we all have parental issues but there was never any big major traumas for me they were all the small t traumas of of the eye rolling and being told that uh a we didn't want you in the first place and b you nearly killed me and c we wanted a daughter you know, where they prefer the daughter. So you can see all these little things begin to build up. Sure. Give a picture of, of moving on forward of somebody who became very quiet, very uh, introverted, couldn't express feelings. So we had a very dominant female uh, role model. And the, the, my, my father was always working. <laughs> we never saw him for seven years, you know. You can see that this picture is building of, of somebody who just become into themselves a lot. Mm. Okay, my heart is already going out to little more little Mark, whose like entire entrance into the world was a struggle. Yeah, you know, fighting for breath, and then being in a place where some of the messages were, you weren't wanted, or you weren't what we wanted. We wanted a girl, or you all almost killed me. Um, those are hard messages, yeah. hard messages for a, a little boy in the 1960s to hear. Yeah, and, and um, looking back, it, it's, it took me a long time in this personal journey to begin to, and it was only really in the past 10 years that I began to incorporate this, but it was something really crucial that I began to understand and ask my mother, who's fortunately still alive, what was going on for her? Mm. What had she gone through in childhood? And her childhood was in the 20s in um, rounded Selby in Yorkshire with mining accidents and childhood illnesses and uh, wars. And I began to realise that there was more at play than just what she did to me. It's what was happening for her that caused this to be manifested in this, in this coldness, this lack of empathy mm -hmm. and, and that and was, was your, a game changer was, what was your mother's name uh we call her rita rita yeah she's 91 years of age and still going strong you know okay um yes yeah, so, uh, so she's obviously a big part of your life you mentioned that she was a, a strong woman a kind of role model she yeah. was born in the you know her child was in the 20s in yorkshire in a mining town yeah, tell us a, tell us a bit more about about Rita. Yeah, okay, that's um, piecing together the stories. If, if you look at it, the, locally they call her a character, um, and it's usually said that her judge she doesn't judge people. They're not fixed judgments; they're welded into position. You know, so she's very. This is the way it's going to be, and this is the way it is, and this is my morality, and this is what I view on. On, on how things are going to go for you, which in later years when I began to be exploring sexuality and whatnot, I, I rebelled against all that, but that's like further down the line. But understanding that, she, her parents were very, very um, closed and rigid. There's one story uh, which I think has immense relevance is that uh, she was saying she, there was a, a mining disaster, it was a bad one. And they said that when the Hooter would go, they would go up to the, the, the mine head. And they'd sit there, the whole family, and all the families would be lined up waiting. They'd wait for the bodies to be brought up. And then they would walk away with the bodies. And said she went, well, this particular one, she waited 24 hours. They were, it was a really bad accident and that they were bringing them up the whole um, And not one of them said, you walked away, you never showed any emotion. They didn't show any emotion while they were waiting for the body. They didn't show any emotion while they were waiting, walking away with the dead. Um, she would have been eight at the time. 
So that carried through into her, you don't show emotion. Mm. So that was one thing that carried through, but it would manifest as the only emotion she could show was anger. Right. So it was a rigid, and what I understand now is she's rigid control of her environment to m manage her own emotional states, and that included the family. Mm. So that, that was a big revelation for me because I just, a long time, really just did not want to engage with her at all. That's why I moved from Wigan to Guildford to Ireland, just to keep mm. her at arm's length, not face this. Mm. And how's your relationship with your mother now, with Rita? It's, it's, it's improved. It's, it's improved a, a lot. She actually says I'm the only one who stands up to her, <laughs> which I take as a positive, you know. But, uh, it took a long time to get there. I say it was, it was mainly, um, it, was, it was probably only five or six years ago we began to, I began to actually change my outlook on what was happening. Mm. Um, but, you know, and, and when I came back from my island, I lived with her for 15 months. And that was really stressing, stretching my calf, you know, because it just highlighted just what it, was, what it had been like and how much I had changed and grown. But we managed it. We supported it. We, you know, I, I got through it in, in the end. And we got, came out with a better understanding mm. of each other. Wow, what a blessing that must have been to come back as an adult and to live with uh, your parents. And yes. I won't talk about myself here, but you know, that's a, an experience I've had. I had last year living with them for my parents for six months. Okay. Well, and blessings that this super strong woman with some, you know, a character who has been welded and, you know, gone through the fires of the 1920s yeah. in a mining community is still with us and your relationship is still strong. Yeah. Um, I like I feel her now like it feels like oh, yeah, I've got a really clear picture of her um can we just take a breath with her to acknowledge her, her yeah. kind of presence here her energy yeah well Rita thank you and so what um what did she give the young Mark then, 14? You know, let's move on to the, the kind of 14, the Star Wars era Mark. <laughs> it's about, you know, what Mark was like then. What gifts did your mother um, give you or she, burdens did she give you? Oh, right. Well, we'll, we'll talk, with the, talk about the gifts looking back on it. And that's very useful because sometimes like people just look back at what they did. But sometimes there are gifts in there. She gave me incredible self-reliance. Hmm. You know, which um, in some ways is good, but in other ways, taken to an extreme, it's bad because you're pushing people away. Um, but she, she gave me um, a sense that I could stand on my own two feet, that it was, um, I had a, an incredible internal strength to face a lot of, of life's, life's adversities. Um, and, and, and of course, everything was the, you know, it, it was like um, I, I was clothed and fed, but the, the, the essential thing that was missing was compassion, really. And, 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 and surely, da and, and look back down now, and, and there were times that there were, was compassion there, but it, it tended to, to have to suppress those memories. And um, it's, uh, oh, it, it was last year, actually, I was doing some in, internal work in Poland on um, understanding child trauma, that an actual positive memory came back from a young age, which is of just sort of like rubbing her feet on a Saturday night. And, and, and up until then, I had no memories of early childhood altogether. And that was a beautiful blessing to come back and actually feel there was a time that we did have this connection. But it was always this low level, not being able to do what I wanted. And, and this is where I'm going to be really ultra vulnerable now, because as the positive memories came back, there was a memory came back that was um, really took me by surprise. And that was at the age of 15. There's this such a low level sort of not frustration, but uh, depression or, or um, sadness is that I actually got access to some tablets and a bottle of vodka and actually uh, took some tablets. And I actually vomited it up 
quite later and then suppress the memory of it. So from that, um, I then decided that when I was going to go, I was going to choose a university that was furthest away from home. I needed to get home. This was not good for me. But that memory had gone deep into the subconscious. But it's just something that, again, has come up for mm. me to, to, to process. And it, it, it's, it's, it's quite amazing, really, that we can suppress memories like that and, uh, and yet still feel that because this sort of bubbling feeling underneath that I couldn't express my feelings has been carrying on throughout my whole life and into my relationships. So it's all this that's happened. You know, the, the Reiki and what the, what's the type, the Endura, I have a typical body type of Endura, we couldn't do, I couldn't express feelings. My journey was to identify feelings. I needed to identify feelings. Um, they were abstracts to me. They were, you know, somebody said, do you feel joy? And I suddenly realized, so I've got this wild career in, in, in science. I'm heading up exponential growth up, up the management ladder. And I suddenly realized, I don't know what feeling of happiness actually is. What is joy? What is happiness? Mm. It's all like a, a numbing out. And that's when I suddenly began to look at Tantra and, and this type of stuff to bring me in contact with body, my body. Yeah. Um, I just want to acknowledge there that, that, that you, you just, you know, told a really vulnerable story about you when you were sort of 14, 15 with that bottle of vodka and some tablets. So, you know, that's a really powerful, you know, yeah. that's not, you know, remembering that and to, to go through that for a young man, or, or, or a boy really to do that you know that's a big thing to do so let's just like like really bring him into presence here that little mark what would he say to you right now what would he say about his life right then just feel into what he's saying and um He's he's actually just looking looking at saying saying no. He said, "Well, I was giving you a message, but I couldn't articulate to you at that time." And you listen to it, you know. Um, he's saying that it took you a long time to begin to go for feelings, but yeah, immediately what comes up for me is you listen to the message was not the fact that you done. So it was it was a cry for help from little me to another part of me saying, you need to get out of this situation. This situation will ultimately destroy you. So it, 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 that's, I think, has, has been my reflection over that. That's what he would say to me, is you listen to what I was trying to tell you. And if you could go back there now and you could be with him, what would you tell little Mark? I think I'd tell him that you did a bloody good job. You know, you got your message across, but to get me to the, you need, you, you, you did the job you had to do to actually get you did what you had to do. Up. You did what you had to do. Yeah. yeah. What a strong little boy Mark was. Yeah, it's, uh, and, and that, that is part that, so there's the resilience that um, my mother built into me. On one hand, there's a certain resilience she built in, but on the other hand, there's a, a, a complete fragility on another aspect of me you know, that's not been fully developed. It took my time to develop that, you know. Well, thank you, Mark. I just want to acknowledge your, you know, your strength and courage to get to talking about that vulnerable moment. Thank you. Um, it's a beautiful story to hear, and I. I'm pretty sure that there will be other people who had difficult times in their life when they were young. And if they didn't attempt suicide, they may have thought about it a lot. Yeah. So thank you for just bringing some air and some light around those kind of events. You know, that's really important to be able to talk about them. And yes. Let them out in the open. Yeah, it is. Because I can feel it now in my chest, just opening something up. Even talking about it here in this detail has, has released a little bit more that uh, I can actually feel it now. You know, there's a little bit of warmth in the chest and a little bit of a releasing of something, being able to. And I think one of the things as well is always a fear of rejection. So being yeah. able to say this and you holding space for me again, you know, it's, it's almost therapeutic even in our conversation. What we're doing.
Um, just as a quick question, what did um, that Mark, teenage Mark, like music? Did he like listening, or what did he like doing? Oh, uh, I was very much in my room all the time. But, um, I was very much alone. I still am to, to be an extent, but uh, I actually um, got into very much into the prog rock in the 70s. So I was a Rush fan, you know? So there's always that like, I, oh, I like lyrics that uh, are out of hit, out, bit out, out the world, like, you know, 2112 and Hemispheres and things like that. And uh, I'm very much into reading, I'm very much so that aspect. And then again, into this looking at stuff and reading and, 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 and visual arts. Um, and then actually my first album was ABBA, so work that one out. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm just doing a, an album challenge at the moment where I'm posting a, an album every day on my yeah. own Facebook wall. And I posted Wham! today, make it big. <laughs> yes. but i uh, so i'd just like to invite you like after this interview at some point i'm going to go and do this i'm going to celebrate mark by playing some rush from the 1970s oh, brilliant yeah i'm let's, going to put uh, on one of my favorite that mark ones today. Uh, see if i can find a, 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 one of my favorite rush rush ones there and, and play it because uh, uh you know I, I i went seeing them and all that type stuff and which so which track uh if we have to have a recommendation from that time oh i think we what we what i think there is one track that is an absolute classic and i think is really important for these days as well which is closer to the heart so i think that will closer be, to the heart closer to the heart yeah okay so that's the that's the official thing song closer to the heart by rush yeah okay um so it was a big move then for you to go to university and i'm not sure about your your background or your childhood but from your mother's background it sounds a very working class to go to university and to move a long way away to guildford mm. it's a very different town to the yeah. north of england guildford it's um tell us about that journey and, and your journey into science and microbiology yeah you see when and, and and this is something that people who maybe have kids coming through as well now is we didn't have the i, I was the first one ever in our family to go to university. Um, um, my father had, had somehow worked his way up and, and he, he became an engineer from America, a manager in an American company. He moved to Libya for seven years to work building a desalination plant. So, um, and I didn't really know what I was going to do. And uh, just in this, my last year of doing biology, A-level biology at the time, um, they did a six months microbiology course. I, thought, oh, I really like this, you know, you know, I can, I can put something here and grow it on a plate and see what comes off my skin. And, and, and um, looking at, uh, again, the, you know, like the, the, the science of medicine and, 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 and uh, medical disease. And I thought, oh, I'm really into this. Let's see if I can do a microbiology degree and can I do it in a place that's far enough that I don't have to go home every weekend you know so we can still 60 plus miles away from um, and they just have there was a microbiology degree going there and I did it and I absolutely loved it I throw myself into this stuff as well but you know it's like 20 30 years later you think I've built a career from nothing from this I've gone through microbiology DNA fingerprinting for um forensics and all this type of stuff and then into um, a whole big aspect of EU representative for Ireland and then turn around and say well no I actually don't want to do that you know you come 27 years late and you go it's not me anymore mm. you know, if I could have my time again I'd do psychology so it's I, I suppose the message there is we don't know what we're going to be but you know you can always change yes we can always not change. Nothing set in stone. But give the kids the opportunity to go for it. Yeah. Okay, so you you studied microbiology because you got fascinated as a you know as you as you yeah. do when you were you know studying your A levels. You yeah. know you you get passionate about something and you follow it. And so you had a, a long career, twenty plus years, um, doing all sorts of exciting things in in Ireland, DNA fingerprinting, and you know working for the EU. What were you like then um, during this period? Oh, that's that's a uh, really interesting question. I was actually really almost like a little mini mother 
I was very structured and very controlled in everything that I wanted to do. So, you know, it was a case I, I knew there was stuff going on for me. And so if you like, I wanted to, to so I know Gabba Mackie talks about it now, but the, my particular addiction was being the best I could be mm -hmm. at that particular career, for example. Um, and it was masking the fact that underneath it had this, it still had this low level um, lack of joy in life going on. It was, it was effectively masking that. Mm. It was, I was out there dealing with things rather than in here dealing with what I needed to, to, to actually deal with. So that was manifesting in relationships. So career wise, brilliant going straight through, but like personal wise, it was a little bit of a, a numbing out again. Mm. Sort of a numbed out person until about 1995 and then as a sideline I began to think what, what's this thing called Tantra <laughs> that's moved into it yeah. okay so okay I'm getting a you know I'm getting a feeling of you know you know ambitious very capable very hard very um you know outwardly focused kind of mark you know making making his way in the world mm. and doing things but now, 1995, that would have been parallel at the same kind of time that you kind of, because often what happens is people, you know, get really, really far and then they'll have a breakout or a burnout and something yeah. will change for them. But it sounds like it's a little bit different with you if it was in the 90s that you started discovering Tantra. So yeah. it sounds like that might have developed um, in parallel. It, it did, yeah. It, it, it was a sudden realising that a lot of what I was doing... Um, was actually down to um, insecurities as well. My, I had a lot of internal insecurities, which would feature me trying to control everything around me. Not in, in, an, in an overtly controlling sense, but trying to manage my own sort of feelings that I couldn't name. And, mm. um, were, and, 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 and my sort of attachment issues that come through from childhood. So, it was beginning to uncover these and, and, and use it. And that's where I began to suddenly explore this thing called breathwork. You know, in the tantric field to bring me close in and it brought a lot of stuff up very quickly. Mm. Okay. Um, yeah, so tell us about tantra then. Tell us about, you know, what your experience with that, what that taught you, where that brought you, how that kind of started to bridge the gap from your you know, very controlled mother type personality to, to where you are now to that kind of softer inside part now. Yeah. So, um, reflecting back, I think in 1995, there wasn't even an internet around. So I was trying to, in Holy Catholic Island, trying to, I came across this, this one single teacher in Ireland who, uh, I got friendly and got talking to and, and, um, it turned out there's a, there, there, there's a, a beautiful tantra teacher called Don Cartwright who visit, visited, started visiting Ireland around about that time. And um, I, I begin to explore it, of course, the first thing you think is, oh, it's, it's all about sex, isn't it? You know, and then I, I, I went to my first workshop in Athlone, I think it was, so I've, I've been exploring this idea around tantra and what, what it all is. And then my, my first workshop came up about two years later. So it was just beginning to, to, and I was trying to find my own way. And I just blew my mind you know, that we would do these breathwork techniques that would bring us into the body and begin to bring us into this thing called uh, body energy, our, our, our subtle uh, um, biofields. You know, and up to that, I had no, not a clue about it. And then I began to just open and soften into that. And so it was a 10 year journey into me doing all this until there was a, an event that um, decided for me that I wanted to actually bring this out to people. And as usual, it was a traumatic event that really, like this, what's happening here is going to be a traumatic event. It's going to create changes for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. This was an event that happened in our family that really focused my mind on who I want to be and, and, and what I want to do. And that's when I realized that science would, uh, I, I, I still love it. But I, for me, I needed to go in a different direction. Sure. And that was, How old are you at this point? Oh, goodness. Uh, must have been about 44, 45 yeah. at that point. Maybe, a bit, you maybe a bit younger. Maybe a bit younger. See, I, I'd never had kids. 
mm-hmm. and uh, I have a brother and they have one child and he, had, he got, um, he, he had an underlying condition, but he got uh, a sudden infection by a very common organism called streptococcus and he stopped his heart and he died. And he 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 um, was gone within two minutes. So and that was a massive trauma for the whole family. Mm-hmm. And um, sort of not in, in in sort of homage or in honour of that, it made me realise that you know intellectually I understood what we're going from. But I couldn't until at one point I absolutely I, I managed to function for my family through the and it got home. Then suddenly I just collapsed and broke down. And then I said to myself, well, you know, is this what you want to do? Is this what you're doing here at the moment? You know, life is impermanent. There's nothing permanent. It can be taken very quickly. So um, where do I want to go? And that got me changing and switching into, into this field of support, my journey and supporting others through their journey as well, you know. That's a... Um... You know, that's a brutal, that's a brutal realization to have, you know, to have the death of a child in your family. Um, you know, for that to happen is, is, is such oh, a life changing event for so many people. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And given their ages, well, it was the only child and they were in the 50s at the time, you know, he was 28. And 28, he's just springboarding out, you know. So, um, and it was just this very common organism called streptococcus, um, urinary tract infection, just overwhelmed the system straight away. And what was your nephew's name? Michael. Michael. And is it okay just to, like, honour... Honor Michael yes. here as well. And yeah, he was a cheeky bugger. I loved him a lot. <laughs> you know, so that was about it, you know. Cheeky bugger. Okay, let's have a breath with che- the, the, Michael the cheeky bugger. Yeah. Okay. So he had a big impact on you. And it's normally the other way around, you know, uncles uh, are the ones there to kind of guide and to kind of inspire, uh, you know, the younger generation. But you know what, as a teacher, I have found so many times that it's actually, I learn way more than the kids and they inspire me more than, you know, any influence I could have on them. So um, you did a about turn from your career working in you know science and that kind of world and you moved back to the UK and you started to pursue different things and just reading your bio earlier there's a whole lot of different things that you have done um you know in that period tell us about some of the the ways you began exploring that other side to yourself yeah um I'm say I, it's I once the big change shift in, in consciousness happened there for me, I was still in Ireland too, so it was like a good 10 year period. I thought, well, I want to get out of this and I want to do begin to really explore what's going on. And I was very much, because science is all head-based, looking at the CBT, looking at the, the coaching to, um, to provide this opening that I needed, or I believed I needed. And, uh, but there were still things missing. And it was as more and more I went into the Tantra before I actually decided to become a Tantra teacher and really immerse in it, it began to realize that it was not just the head that was needing to be experienced, it's the body as well. Mm-hmm. And that there's a disconnect here. And this is actually a, a safe space for me. So, in. Oh, I love in, that. This is a safe space for me, being up in your head. And I. Yeah. I know myself and so many other people where that has been their refuge for so long. Yeah. Here where you can think and you could gnaw all that feeling down below. And this, what's happening now with with the coronavirus thing, I am now, um, I have so many papers, I've gone into my head and studied it and understood it and what's going on with it and how it's affecting us, how it works, what it's likely to do. It's all my head stuff. I'm actually using it as a very much a self-soothing. Mm. means uh, okay I'm, I'm talking about it and writing about it but it is it is a way i'm uh, i'm managing my environment again 
mm. to keep my anxiety levels low, you know, but without feeling where that anxiety is at the moment. But if I was going to ask it, it'll actually go right now and I can point towards my uh, diaphragm and say it's right at the level of the, where the diet, you know, the, the third chakra, the solar plexus, mm. that's where I'm feeling it at the moment. So, you know, but that was my journey. It's coming from the head based into the body based. And beginning to integrate the two, understanding how my thoughts were beginning to affect my feelings and how my feelings were affecting how I acted as well, you know, so giving it this, this, this space to develop and see what comes up. Mm. You know, and it was the body work that really gave the, uh, and the breath work that really gave this icky insights. And so is that when you move from say CBT to doing massage? I did the massage first, actually, because my my initial ideas were that I, that I would have a three pronged approach with, with tantra and then um, uh, massage therapy and um, standard massage therapy, and then the coaching as well, and maybe sexuality coaching around that. Uh, but I was really fortunate at that time to 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 meet and um, a, a lovely woman who who also interested in tantra. So we set up, we started working together. And, and that was a, a brilliant thing to do for five minutes that we would work together and so you have you have although we tried not to be gender based you know you do have these these two different subtle energies coming through the more mm. dominant energy and the more receptive energy and we could switch and change whenever it needed to be so that was a beautiful thing to actually begin to to work into allowed us to, me to grow and learn about what, what was going on in teaching this okay and then she so from all this you huge melting pot or almost like crucible of different uh, practices and um, traditions and skills that you developed, you moved into breath work. Um, so yeah, tell us about how that transition happened and tell us about, you know, or maybe even a compare and contrast. What is it that you find so powerful about breath work now? Actually, no, let's tell us about your journey, how you discovered breath work first, and then we'll talk about. Yeah. A bit more of the heady stuff about comparing them. Yeah, okay. So what, one of the things with, like, the, 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 for me, um, my experience of Tantra was all through the breath work, through breathing. Uh, and, and, and So um, that was my first way in through breath work. Um, so I managed to deepen that practice, but I always felt that there was a lot more that could be, uh, could be worked with. And, and I literally stumbled across this, the, the Biodynamic Breath and Trauma release. I was looking to redesign a website. So I just put biodynamic work and then this came up and I looked at it and immediately it was like a click. This is something that is, that just really resonated because it was like all I'd done in the Tantra field and, and, and the CBT field and everything began to come into this point. And I thought, let's go for this and see mm -hmm. what it's like. And then this was like, coming home it was just like really feeling into it and then the deeper I went into it the stuff that I knew was not being touched got touched you mm. know? it got touched without getting into the head of the things and um, it just showed me just how powerful the body can be and sometimes how uh, something like a talking therapy while effective this core stuff it may not get to yeah but the breath does because it brings you in deep contact with it. So that in a nutshell will be it. I love that expression. It's just, it, it felt like coming home. Mm. Uh, and that really reminds me of the Ram Dass saying, you know, we're all just walking each other home. So yeah, this is a really interesting journey that you've got here, Mark, because, you know, you, your entire childhood and your relationship and your mother is a role model and, a, you know, a caregiver to you. And, you know, you going into that kind of very strict scientific emotionless world you know in your head um and then developing a more esoteric interest in tantra which is on the scale of things much further out there than say breathwork is yes yeah. tradition but then coming home and bringing that back to especially biodynamic which is uh you know is very empirical as well you know there's hard science behind it there's a lot of you know structure um you know, there's a, there's a lot of theory behind it as well. It's not just something crazy out there as well. So it feels like those two, those two paths inside you, those two sides in you started to real converge when you discovered breathwork. Yeah. 
yeah, I really, I, I think that that is it in a nutshell as well, because, you know, it's getting my teeth into polyvagal theory is, is really resonating with the, the, the part of my head that does that. And then that it's really into, this, this is how it goes, you know, and, and I do, uh, like, um, we, I do workshop with somebody called Charmaine Berry, I don't know if you know her, and, and, and I do the talk about all the theory side of this, this particular aspect of polyvagy, and I'm loving it. I do love that aspect. And then when we're doing the breath work, and I'm doing the, I'm loving that aspect as well. So it is. It's like there is a completeness coming into what I I have now. It's not. I always used to view tantra. I used to view tantra like the yin yang sign. That I yeah. just said tantra was the join between the white and the black. Well, that's the science and the spirituality side coming in, and I'm. Dithering, I'm, I'm on that line between the, the white and the black, straddling both lines and wandering around with it. You know? That's a love. That's a. I, I love that tantra is the line between the black and the white of the um, yin and yang. Yeah, that's really lovely. Okay, so if you had to kind of compare and contrast um, some of the other practices that you've done, like um, tantra and breath work. Where's what, what does um, Tantra bring that breath work doesn't or vice versa? Well, I think one of the things that I realized um, through doing, well, you know, the, the Tantra work, which is more Neo-Tantra or working with like the intimacy is absolutely beautiful thing to work with. But um, sometimes I could see that people were traumatized and they were blocking themselves out from it. Or yeah. you could be teaching a breath work, a, a tantric breathing exercise that would um, be focused on the pelvis and people were becoming really, really activated. And I, so it was at the back of my mind, is, 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 is this necessarily for people who are traumatized? Because this breath work I'm doing now is for trauma relief. Yeah. If, people, if we're going to be bringing in people who uh, may be traumatized into workshops and you may not, they may have suppressed it or they don't know, is that we need to know what we're doing. We need to do our journey and we need to know what we're doing with this. We need to have what, what you call now trauma-informed practice. And the, so I, that was one of the major differences, the, the, way I, the top-down approach as well. So you'd start at the top of the here and work through the Reiki and belts of tension if necessary. Whereas, so that means that you'd be developing a sense of safety and trust with someone because you're not working with the sexual center straight away. You're mm. working with everything else to slowly uncover around it so that they can become comfortable with feeling their own body before you go for a hot spot or a hot zone, something that's really triggering for them, you know? So yeah. um, a worthy coming together is, is a sense of gentleness you can bring into it. So the gentleness from the Tantra, so you're not, forcing someone to go in to breathe 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 you're not doing that you're allowing them to begin to explore it with themselves and you're tuned in to support them through so that's similarity with that mm. um it, and it's also yeah that the way this particular system works you, you you begin to understand and see everything through the eyes of the other person's nervous system to see how that is being activated and worked with so it's a very practical body-based you know um the process rather than just okay well we want you to 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 just breathe gently to expand your uh, kundalini energy through your body with this one you're making space within the person's body so it can flow through easily and you're doing it in a way that's creating safety and and and, and, and they're able to manage their own triggers whether that be in a sexual setting such later in a relationship or just in life in general Mm -hmm. So it's much wider. It's a bigger, it's a bigger subject. It's not just touching on our sexuality. The breath work for, for me is touching on all the aspects that we may have been traumatized in. From shock trauma through to uh, surgery trauma through to uh, any type of interpersonal trauma and complex PTSD and, and complex yeah. developmental PTSD. It, it's, it's a wider subject field that you can begin to work with with breath work as opposed to tantra tantra is mainly for me is mainly about just exploring self and, and, and doing it by connecting to our body um but connecting mainly with sort of our sexual energy to move it um but that okay. may be only part of 
part of the the the, the concern that they have. There may be much more depth to what's going on for them. Does that make sense? Yeah. Sort of yeah, rambled so. on there. I think so. Uh, the the breathwork kind of you know encompasses more things than just the kind of the, the energy or the the line between the masculine and the feminine, yeah. and that kind of body stuff. Okay, uh, so one question I often like to ask people is um, to describe a powerful or profound breathwork experience that they have had. Oh, yeah, I think that the, the, the one that was the breakthrough one for me was, um, I, I was doing some, I think it was my level three or four training in Poland. And, uh, Things had been coming up for me all week. I knew something needed to be done and, and I, I had never been allowed to express feelings. You know, this was a, a mother who would allow you to express feelings. So I wandered over to, to the person who was supporting me. He, so I was going to be breathing and she was going to support me. So I need to ask you a favour. And I need to be able to do a lot of sweary, shouty stuff at you and uh, really let go. Do you think you can hold space for that? I said, yeah. So I, as I activated my system, activated my breath, came into contact with this deep thing I'd not touched. I allowed it to touch it and I knew I wouldn't be rejected. This person had already said, yeah, I'll hold it for you. And, and, and it allowed me to really cut loose on a whole lifetime's worth of stuff I wanted to say. And then that just opened that up completely. You know, the whole mm. body open. Somebody said you, you, you actually look like you're about an inch or two taller than you than than before the week uh, started, you know, because as Reiki endures, we hunched down and actually stood taller and, and was standing in a totally different mm. way of being just mm. because of that one session. So in that breath work, you were able to like really, really touch your anger. It's feeling like if you're swearing. Yeah, lot. my anger, my resentment. Um, my need to fully express to 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 uh, a woman the uh, all that anger and resentment that was that had been coming from my childhood. It had been in there in my childhood, but because of the nature of of, of uh, the way I had suppressed it, I couldn't. It was always a problem for me to express this uh, with women because of fear of rejection. And she was able to hold it for you. She held it. Yeah, she's brilliant. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I can feel that. I feel what that must be like. I get the image of the pressure cooker there, just letting that, that, all that rage and anger and resentment building up, being able to let it off. And the breath work, the skill of you know the power of the breath work and the skill of the facilitator that you were with, enabled you to, to release that. And physically, you were different. You were different after that. Uh, physically and emotionally and confidence-wise and energy-wise, there was a lot more energy flowing, you know, because when, when, we, when we're suppressing these feelings that want to come out, it takes a lot of energy to hold them in the body, you know, so I'd lower myself. And, and, and again, the confidence to turn around and say, I'm, you're going to you know, allow yourself to touch these feelings. It's going to be okay. You're going to be held. Hmm. You know, was, was another thing as well. I can do it. I can go that deep and come out of it the other side. Hmm, amazing. And uh, and what was um, your your experience? As, what was Gitten like as a teacher for you? What was your experience um, learning? What's oh, the, I absolutely the love him. He's amazing. <laughs> Let's tell me about because I know people will would love to hear about the BBTRS training. Yeah, no, he's an amazing teacher. He's really grounded, you know. Um, I, I just, I like the way he, he knows, he, he know, not only does he know what he's doing, he's really open and generous with his sharing on that. And, um, you know, he, he'll say, he'll, he'll say things that really, just, just like a touch, he said, you have to speak louder. He said, I have too much loud music when I was a kid and my ears are fucked up, you know. So I, I, I like that as a touch of, of being human, it brings somebody into, in, rather than being someone who is not accessible, mm -hmm. a guru. He, he's, he's leading from the front in the fact that we, we never class ourselves as therapists, we're supporters. You know, it's a collaboration. So almost what, what we're doing here is a collaboration with him as well. Mm -hmm. you know, so, um, 
and and he's so sim so it's simple it's accessible watching him work when he does the the, the example sessions um it, it's just amazing you know you really pick up a load of stuff and then you experience it yourself and you know, he's quite happy to share his his experiences with you, but also quite happy to listen to what you're saying as well and take it on board. Mm. And that's for me is a sign of a good trainer and good teacher. <laughs> yes, definitely one who's open and humble and doesn't think that they know everything. And this was actually going to be a question, but maybe you've answered already. One of the questions I like to ask people is uh, who or what inspires them now. Oh yeah, well I actually. Um, Geetan inspires me now, but um, I think right at this minute, I'm really inspired by all the, the people who are maybe not, we wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't tell they're aware or they're, they're not doing these particular highfalutin roles, they're just normal people who are on the front line defending mm. the rest of us from whatever's out there at the moment with this virus thing. They're amazing, you know, they're absolutely amazing people. I know some of them on, on the NHS and I know some of them come here for breathwork session. I actually, got, I think I'm gonna cry now because these these guys have just put themselves out there to, to help us and, 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 you know, they're just normal people. So it's just these normal people and everybody who's supporting and everybody who's helping. Normal people. Where I'm living in Topmorden is the same. They're all helping each other. So it's it's not one person that inspires me. It's the community that inspires me. Okay, it's the community and it's the spirit and it's the generosity yeah. and the bravery of just normal people. Yeah. That everyone has this inside them. I can definitely, definitely a ho to that. Should we take a breath with all of those people out there then? Yes. Yeah, that inspires me as well, Mark. I really, I really feel that. Okay, well, let's just talk about a little bit about what you're doing now, what you offer now, um, and what your life looks like now, or maybe even who you are now. Oh, gosh, yeah. So um, I reckon now that uh, if I'd have been, if you'd been interviewing me a few years ago, um, I would be talking more about the technicalities of it. And what you're hearing now is more about me, this conversation is, is about my feelings, who I am, my journey. So I'm more in contact with who I, I, I am now, for one thing. That's, that's who I am now. Um, and definitely a work in progress. You know, definitely a work in progress. We don't, you know, um, we don't stop learning till um, till the day we do take our last breath as far as I'm concerned as well um, and I'm not that old and crusty yet that I got fixed in my way so I can, I can work with that uh, what do I offer well I, 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 I do mainly with this one I do workshops and one-to-ones one -one would be my major one I do but we're having to take that online mm -hmm. um, obviously because of it, it's breath work and we, we are uh, can be exposed and I, I know I closed down very early I think we talked about it back on the 13th of March and my last client the 13th of March the last client I had because I was looking at all the data we thought we're okay here told me four days later that he had symptoms so I was managing all that coming through what did this mean for me so that was a really uh, intriguing journey of self-discovery for me as well Mm. So, yeah, we, and, and so I'm moving online with this um, until we get the all clear and then we'll, I'll, I'll see where it goes on that. Um, I, do, I do group sessions in Halifax, Preston, Manchester. Um, and I work, I found a, a, um, a beautiful collaboration with uh, Charlene Berry, who's an internal family systems therapist as well. Um, we, so we're working with mind and body to do a simple ways of, of, of soothing the nervous system. You know, so it's vagal nerve activation to uh, ventral vagal nerve stimulation to actually bring you into complete relaxation. Mm. Um, and uh, just simple exercises to enable you on a day-to-day -day basis to, to reduce the anxiety and the panic that may be you know, the depression that you may be uh, experiencing. 
So quite a bit, actually. Quite a bit. Um, and I'm guessing uh, you've got a web, your website. I'll pop down in the notes a bit later so yeah. people can find yeah. you. Um, you just noticed, uh, you just mentioned a, you know, simple exercises that can help you. Is there something you would like, a little exercise you would like to share now? Could be a breath work, could be just something completely different. Oh, yeah. We, well, we've done breath work and, and um, there is one where you can breathe in for five and out for five. Um, but what I want to show you on this one is actually one that is, is specifically for the vagal nerve and it's from Stanley Rosenberg, Accessing, Accessing the Healing Power of the Vagus Nerve. So it's really simple. You're looking ahead and you place your hands, you cross your fingers like that and you place them back. Just like you, that's it, and just press so you can just feel them touching the lower skull. And as you're looking forward, just keep your head forward. And then you turn your eyes, just the eyes to the right, and you hold that position for 30 to 60 seconds. And you may notice a twitch, a yawn, a sigh. And you look, bring your eyes to the front. Keep your head still, turn them to the left. In 30 and 60 seconds, you just look for something. It can be a simple feeling or a yarn. Look for, there you go, that little yarn there you just gave. Yeah. That's your... activating. That's your activating your uh, ventral vagal. So it's bringing you into social engagement. And just release from the back of the head. Look forward. Release. Notice how you feel. Yeah, I feel like I've got more space in my head. Oh, well, that's a bit trippy. <laughs> yeah. Simple exercise like that. It's it's two minutes. If you do that on um, whenever you need to. A daily basis. I have somebody who, who who said that they do it before they go to sleep and their insomnia is gone. Oh, I'm going to try that. So, you, I mean, you mentioned polyvagal. Would you would you just like to just tell people a little bit about that? Oh well, this is this is the thing that's revolutionising trauma work, isn't it? It's it's, it's 1994. It's it's coming from uh, Stephen Porges, and up until that time, it used, so we 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 realised the had. Uh, the vagus nerve, which moves throughout the whole body and uh, attaches to all our major organs. And then we have the sympathetic nervous system. So the vagus nerve is the parasympathetic. It used to be thought rest and digest, and then uh, flight, fight, sympathetic. So we had this very simple idea of what happens when we, you know, we get activated, we try and run away and fight it. But and Stephen Paul just began looking you could do a whole weekend's workshop on this but he said well it's called it's the vagus nerve but there's more than one branch to it polyvagal more than one and he said and he said there's a, basically uh two evolutionary branches the most highly advanced one is the, the one that's at the front of the at the front of the back of the brain it's myelinated and that's he called that ventral vagal and at the back of it is the most primitive one which is called dorsal vagal and basically what happens is the dorsal vagus is anything below the diaphragm. That's where it touches to. And um, it causes you to go into collapse, freeze and conservation mode. So uh, it, it, the way to revolutionize what we do in breath work, for example, so our breath would activate the sympathetic and see what happens to release the trauma, is that um, not only do you have this movement into sympathetic activation, but if the threat level becomes very high, then you move into complete conservation mode and dorsal vagal collapse. You literally collapse inwards. Mm -hmm. And um, it, 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 a way to look at it is, is, is a ladder, something called Deb Dana has a way, it's called the autonomic ladder. You know, if you're bottom of the ladder, you're feeling very small, very depressed, very quiet, don't want to be here. And then the more you get activated, you can become very, uh, and it become, become more and more animated. You want to get out of this and you want to move. Then if you move out of it, you then go into this ventral vagal where you're nice and relaxed in the social setting. Things are safe. It's all about safety and neuroception, how we view things. But I guess that is a, 
that is a talk for another day on that. But if you can understand what's happening in your own nervous system, mm -hmm. then this is really useful for breath work because you can act, you know, somebody can guide you into activating parts of that to allow whatever's being held in your body to be released and make your own nervous system more resilient. Mm. So whatever did whatever used to affect you just doesn't affect you anymore. Not only are you releasing it from the body, but you're actually making your nerve, you're increasing the resilience and the window of tolerance in the nervous system. And again, a lot of that comes back to childhood. Well, I was about to say that word resilience is how you described the gift that your mother gave you. Yeah, yeah, she gave me a, a measure of resilience. But it was a resilience that was fragile in the fact that what was going on underneath on the, on the, on the neuroceptive level, that the subconscious mm. level, was a lot of activation in my sympathetic nervous system as well. So I would look to ways to actually... We're trying to get up the ladder. We're, tr we're literally trying to keep ourselves safe all the time. So I would try to look for ways of creating safety. But I'd have a lot of energy to do it, but it was also taking a lot of energy. Yeah. yeah ways of making ourselves safe yeah. well believe it or not we've we've already gone over our hour mark oh gosh right sorry okay yeah that's great yeah, that's uh, that's great it's uh, that's a good thing yeah so just the last question i'm going to ask you is um we've talked about what inspired you um you know when you were young from you know ben kenobi to uh, gittin's teaching to the lessons that your mother brought you to your you know, fascination with microbiology to being inspired by the community spirit and generosity and bravery of people. Yeah. Final question is what would you like to inspire in others? Again, just feeling right into that. What one of the things I would like to, to, to think is change is possible. You know, you can always open and be adaptable to change and that things do pass, that whatever, what we see as an insurmountable hurdle or a tsunami of terror actually isn't if we stay in contact with, our, with ourselves and stay in contact with others as well. So it's not an isolation thing. That I don't like this, the word isolating, isolation distance as well. It's more like it's a physical distance. There's my phone gone off. There's my phone gone off. I'll just switch that off. Uh, yeah, so it's not a night. Uh, so that we're not on our own. So change is possible. We're not on our own. Yeah, change is possible that we're not on our own. And it's not, and, it, and it's still connection with ourselves and with others as well. I heard you say as well. Yeah. Well, that was an interesting hour, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. Sorry about that. Just a phone. And that's funny if that was a phone from a group I'm in who's going to support people through the times ahead, you know, it's just phone support. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, this is the idea that we are not alone, We're never alone. We are never alone. Well, thank you so much for coming on today. Um, it's, it's been a, a beautiful hour. I feel like I've learned a lot, but I've also feel like I've connected with you mm -hmm. in different stages of your life. I feel like I've learned something as well. So, um, Let's finish off with a breath together. How about that? Pleasure. So thank you, Mark. Thank you. I'll post up your links to your website. Uh, my name is Ben. I'm from Breathing Space. Um, I run these inspiring interviews, conversations about breath twice each week on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Uh, next, we have Suta Rawson, who's talking about darkness retreats. That's on this Thursday coming. Um, so I shall look forward to seeing everyone then.